So here we are at uh, part two of our series where we're looking at um, wisdom, Sophia, and Zanna, the harlot. And um, you probably want to watch the first part if you um, haven't had a chance to. A lot of what I'm uh, going to mention may not make sense. Um, there's a couple things we're going to go on um, and add that are actually not in the notes that I... Uh, sent in the PDF. So there's something else I I came across that was just amazing. It's just so interesting, so exciting um, uh, regarding this subject that um, I didn't see before. So uh, we're going to do that tonight and um, we're going to add some other things that aren't exactly on there. When we did this earlier this week, uh, we, we didn't finish all of page two. My, my hope was that this part would be page two, um, but we're we're just going to get to some into some stuff. Some of it's very controversial, um, but the hope is that everything is very clear and that we can see that you know God is good, and he you know he does things for a reason, and uh, you know he he has commandments. They're not suggestions. They're commandments, um, and we can learn. Um, that he does things in order, and he does things for a reason. So um, many kind of mysteries and confusion and different things have come of resu as a result of uh, kind of the subject matter, or really the war that is going on between wisdom and anti-wisdom, if you will. It's like, you know, it's like Marvel Comics. So, um, so the first thing we're going to do in this um, session is we're going to look at something I, I didn't quite piece together before, but it's quite uh, remarkable. And that is, the it's again, we're going to start with the subject of the world that then was. So, uh, the world that then was, again, we're talking about Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2. The earth was without form and void. So, um, the Hebrew words without form and void is tohu, without form, and void, bohu. And these words depict an environment of a place that's been subject to judgment. And so, as we go on in the days of creation, God made it and it was good. But for some reason, we find the earth, it is not good. Darkness covers the deep. It's without form and void. So God had to redo something. But something happened there. So the other place in the Bible where these two words, um, tohu and bohu, are together is in Jeremiah chapter 4. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at Jeremiah chapter 4, and it gives us a description of this world, of this place, of what took, ha what took place, what happened. Now, uh, um, Jeremiah is describing this, and... Um, gives remarkable uh, details and a remarkable prophetic word about this, uh, this event. So if we go to Jeremiah 4, 23, uh, Jeremiah says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form, tohu, and void, bohu. So these same words are used. So Jeremiah is telling us where we are. We're in Genesis 1, chapter 2, before God said, let there be light. So now that's where we are. And the heavens, they had no light. So the, uh, so the earth is in a place where there's no sun in the solar system. Even the, 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 um, the space and the universe around the earth, there are no stars. There may not be a Milky Way. I don't, I don't know. But there's, it's not just the earth that's without form. Even around it, Judgment has taken place, and there's no light. That's why when God said, let there be light, bang, the, the, the power of God, the light, God himself is on the scene. Um, and then this whole section of the universe begins to uh, come alive. Okay. I beheld the mountains, and they trembled, and hills, and they moved um, lightly. So the earth had mountains and hills. I beheld, and there was no man. Well, man wasn't created yet. And all the birds of the heavens 
had fled. So there were animals. There were birds that were here that now had fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. So there were plants. And this, all the cities um, were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. So this world had, the earth had cities. Um, and what I believe is that this, this uh, section of time was a time that angels ran, you know, essentially God's creation. So, um, so basically uh, you have, obviously you have Lucifer, you have many of the angels, and here we're, we're focusing on Zana. But the church has always told us about Lucifer, he was the anointed cherub, and he fell. But there's also a lot of vivid detail and description about Zana and what she did. So we looked at that before in Ezekiel chapter 16. And we could see how, who she was as God raised her up and bore her in his heart and married her all prior to her leaving the father and, you know, essentially uh, following her own kingdom and following with those that also fell with Lucifer. So, um, so there were cities. And many of these, um, you know, we call them principalities and powers, many of them were already here. So they were already on the earth. They were already on physical places on the earth that ran cities. Um, there's a lot of unexplained things and architecture and large stones and cities that are, some of them are under oceans and stuff. Um, it could, it's quite possible that this is the time we're looking at. It's not even at the time of mankind. They're cities. Um, and verse 27, for thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate. So the land becoming desolate. And then he says, yet I will not make a full end. So all this judgment, all this takes place on the earth. But God's saying it's not going to take a full end. I'm going to, you know, do judgment, but I'm going to do something again where it's not over. And then we have the six days of creation later. Verse 28, for this shall the earth mourn and the heavens be black. Again, the, the earth, the very land and the earth was crying out from the sin of, the, of what the angels were doing. And it just reached the point where God had to say enough is enough. It's just like the judgments of, of Noah, Sodom and Gomorrah. This is a very similar thing, but we're dealing with not humans, but angels. Um, and again, the heavens in the whole area... Um, around the earth or, or, you know, some proximity, I don't really know how to describe that, also became black. Because I have spoken it, I have purposed it, and I will not repent, neither will I turn back. So God is really mad about this. Um, the whole city shall flee from the noise of horsemen and bowmen. So, uh, so basically what happens within these cities is, you know, many of the angels, they're, you know, they're, they're spirit beings, but, you know, they can also appear, obviously, physically to, to uh, people in our, our dimension, but they operate in other dimensions. But here, see what happens when the judgment comes, there's a war in the heavens. And so the war is the horsemen and the bowmen. And so there's the release of the Lord of hosts upon these cities to bring judgment. And so there's a sound that's going out of the time. They've been warned. They have, they have not repented. And they've just continued these things. And judgment, is, and judgment is coming. And they shall go into the thickets and climb upon the rocks. And every city shall be forsaken and that no man will dwell therein. So this is the, this is the war that's taking place. The war is to purge and wipe, wipe um, upon the face of the earth all these beings and to just cleanse it so the earth can um, be cleansed. And when you are spoiled, um, what will you do? Now watch this. Though you clothe yourself with crimson, though you deck yourself with ornaments of gold, who does this sound like? This is the harlot. We saw her in Ezekiel 16. We, we know what happens to her in Revelation 17. This is her. So she's here. Though you um, 
rent your face with painting in vain shall you make yourself fair your lovers will despise you and they will seek your life so it is not even describing lucifer here it is describing the harlot and so what the harlot is doing is she's making a last ditch effort of the things that have worked with her before so she's trying to trade with the warring angels and she's decking herself out it's just like jezebel in second kings 9 when she knew judgment was coming she painted her face and she made herself beautiful to try and manipulate and coerce those that were bringing judgment to sneak out of it <laughs> but you know it's just she's doing the same thing so it's the same pattern now remember Zana is the mother of harlots and Jezebel is just one of her daughters. So uh, her daughters are, you know, Jezebel, uh, Delilah, uh, Athelia, or Athaliah. All these are just daughters. So wisdom has daughters as well. She has, wisdom has her seven uh, maidens. And there's, there's knowledge and understanding. And so she has hers as well. But the counterfeit um, are some of these other ones. And what the... And what they do is they, they are a representation of their mother. And so when you see Jezebel painting her face, this is the harlot here. Because this is even before mankind. All right, watch this. For I have heard the voice of a woman in travail, the anguish of her that brings forth her first child. So this woman is crying out, ah, have mercy on me, God. Well, it's too late. She's going to be rent from her kingdom and uh she's going to be displaced but i also believe this is prophetic because she's still here this final judgment i mean there's something that took place here when god is bringing judgment to the earth but the final judgment is not until we get to revelation 17 and 18 when we see babylon is falling so remember her city is babylon but remember, Babylon isn't just, oh, since mankind, you know, you have this place, you know, in the Middle East. This, the, the system of Babylon, the religious system, the false system of Babylon was here. It was, bef it was done when the angels first served God, just like Zana. God bless me, you know, uh, and she, and in and, and God's blessing, she had a city. So she knew how to operate in God's order. His, his way of doing things. And, uh, and it, it's almost like a religious order that she took when she was with God, and then she twisted it. And so what she's good at is she's good at taking God's order and twisting it. And so remember when she, it's talking about crimson, it's talking about the wool that's dyed in red. So it looks like the Lamb of God. It looks humble, it looks meek, it knows how to play the game. It even looks like it's died in the blood. But it's not. It's false. It's a false system. So, what we have to do is identify these systems. How do they work? What is, what is she doing? Where is she seated? How, how does this work? And that's, that's what we're going over. But we have to go to the beginning and look at how this all started. And that's what, it's all right here. So her daughters copy her. So when we see Jezebel, she copies her. It's the same thing. But this um, weeping and mourning doesn't, you know, have a final fulfillment until we get to Revelation 17. Now, the other thing I want to mention, guys, is that when you're studying this stuff and you realize that you know, it, when you have all this sin and rebellion, it's like, my goodness. You know, it's like the angels did these things. They were kicked out, but they're not gone altogether. God allows, always allows his creation to decide what you want to do. What do you want to do? And these beings never, some of them never left. Some are incarcerated in other places. But some of them are still here, and he allows mankind to decide. You decide. It's up to you. But what he wants is he, 
when they fell and they were um, displaced, and then, he, and then uh, we have the six days of creation, the dominion he gave to Adam was to overcome them. Adam failed in the garden. God said, I'll have a nation. I'll raise up Abraham. His children will overcome them. They don't. In fact, the whole description in Ezekiel 16 is how she brings down kingdoms. She knows how to bring down kingdoms. So when we're looking at Jerusalem in Ezekiel 16, you're watching the pattern of the harlot trade or partner with the kingdom to bring it to destruction. And it worked. It happened. It's happened a few times. Um, so then God says, well, I'll send my son. And he gets victory over these things. Destroys principalities and powers. And then the son says, I'm... I will be seated at the right hand of the Father. All power and authority is given to me. Those that believe, go in my name. And so now what you have? You have the church. And surely we would overcome these things. We're not doing a good job. They're still out there. Uh, some of them have not been displaced ever. They're still there. But we have no excuse. God sent his son. Now, obviously, he knew we'd fail, but he's given us a shot to do this, but he will have to come himself and clean and purge and straighten this thing out. But that's why Revelation judgments are so bad, because these things have been going on for a long time. They're not dead. But he, God allows these things around, and you can decide. You can listen to them, or you can listen to him. <laughs> so I think this is amazing uh, in verse 31 then it says the voice of the daughter of Zion now if you actually look up the just do a word search daughter of Zion you'll see that it many times it relates to, to judgment you'd love to think that oh th this is the church or whatever um, but it, it many times it relates to judgment and remember Zana came from Zion Zana came from heaven Zana knew the throne. Zana knew New Jerusalem. She knew that. She's a daughter of that. But she left. Um, that bewails herself, that spreads her hand, saying, Woe is me, for my soul is weary because of the murderers. So, um, again, her murderers is going to be the beast. That's who's going to actually destroy her in Revelation. Amazing. Okay. Well... See, I told you this was going to take long. <laughs> so, um, the next thing I want to go over is I wanted to show you that because of this whole world that then was and, and who we're dealing with. She's been around a long time. Um, and the other thing I wanted to do is I, we know the story, um, certainly of, of, of the Garden of Eden, and those of you that have been to your garden, um, you know uh, what it's like. You know what it's like to hang out with the Lord at your appointed time, to wait with Him, to sit and talk with Him, and uh, you know share great intimacy and everything. And some of you have also noticed the animals in your garden. And uh, you may or may not have um, engaged your animals or talked to them. Um, some of you have. Some of you found pets there. And um, because of that, when you, when you acquaint yourself with the garden, you're just like, wow, this is, this is, you know, this is amazing uh, time to spend with the Lord where he's right here. It's amazing. But you're also in the garden. You're like, oh, this is, this is the way things are supposed to go. Okay? So now those that are, are used to your garden... Um, I want to take you back to the time of Adam and Eve and uh, that, that time to uh, describe more of what um, I believe kind of took place when God set the order for mankind in the beginning, right? So we know Adam was created on the sixth day. And on the sixth day, God commanded him to... Uh, 
take dominion, to rule. And to rule over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air, right? And now, I don't know if you ever asked yourself, but how do you rule, when God made the animals and they're good, how do you rule over something that's good? Well, I was doing this. Um, I was, I have animals and I was, you know, I was like, well, God told me to rule. And they're like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> they're, they're like, God made us and we're good. You don't have to rule us. Show us some leadership. Tell us what to do. I'm like, okay. So a lot of what I'm telling you, my animals taught me. So, so God put Adam there and Adam looks at the animals and they're good. And God said, you know, gave him the instructions. Take dominion. So he has that. He has the he has order, he has dominion and rule in his DNA. Even before he even knows there's going to be anyone else or Eve at this point. He's like, "Well, God told me to take dominion. God gave me orders." So men have that. Men have that in their DNA. Order. Yes, God, God told me, so I must do this. Okay? And then what happens? Then God says, it's not good that man is alone. Now, normally in the church, you would say, they, they skip a verse and say, oh, well, you're, you know, you, Adam needs Eve. But that's actually not what it says. It says, then God brought the animals. So God brought the animals and had Adam name them. Now, when he, now what I believe is that when Adam um, was naming the animals, it wasn't just, you know, you're a, you're a duck-billed platypus. I mean, maybe he said that. So you have a duck-billed platypus. Adam says, you're a duck-billed platypus. But remember, the animal can talk. So he doesn't hear duck platypus, he hears Fred. Oh, this is my name, it's personal to me. There's other duck platypus, platypi, whatever, <laughs> but he's talking to me. So he, it's like a pet, you name it. So the animal hears its name and it's an Adam and the animal form relationship. And they say, well, you know, what do you, what do you hear for? And I believe the animals had innate things that they're created to do. And so, well, my role in God's ecosystem is this. It, or, I am an, an expression of God in this way. Something specific. So, so Adam is naming the animals, but he isn't just naming them like, you know, Sunday school, okay, you just name all the animals. No, I believe he's forming relationship. He's, he's learning about God. He's like, okay, what am I, and it's all new. The animal's like, hey, who are you, dude? And, it, and Adam's like, I don't know, who are you? And so you're, you're all trying to figure this out. So he's naming the animals, and then all of a sudden, there's this dragon, and this dragon's like, hey, Adam, you know, you should eat of this other tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so Adam's like, what? That's, that's, I thought all the animals were good. Now I have an animal here that's telling me to do something different than what God said. Why is that? Oh, God told me to take dominion. You know what, dragon? You're telling me to do something that's contrary to what God told me to do. So I'm going to take dominion over you. I'm not going to listen to you. And I'm going to rule over you. So, guys, the angels were in the garden as animals. And when God said to the serpent, you will go on your belly, well, what did he have before? Arms and legs. So it was a dragon. And so the angels appeared as animals. And so what Adam had to do is he had to figure out, wait a minute, there's, an there's animals here that are good, God created them are good. And then there's other animals that are doing other things. So he had, he's like, okay, I got to distinguish between the good animals and the bad animals. 
you know, go through this exercise. And he's doing this through a relationship, doing, doing this through naming the animals. And, you know, keep in mind that, you know, even though the angels are spirit beings, they are not spirit beings to Adam. He can see them. He can see them plain as day. He can totally see them. It's totally different than the world we're in now. So he can see the angels, but the angels are animals. So you can see principalities in the Bible that are described as animals. Well, they, these were the same animals that were in the garden. And they talked. And they were trying to trick him. So Adam is naming the animals and forming relationship and learning about God and keeping the guard and then doing stuff. We don't know how long. And then God still looked at Adam and said, it's not good that he's alone. And then he makes Eve. And so Eve comes on the seat and says, look at this is great. Look at all these animals. They're already named. The garden is kept. This is great. All these animals God made are good. Now, um, you know, it's quite possible that Adam told her, honey, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But remember, Adam has already gone through the process of the animals and determine, okay, this is good and this is bad. So Eve shows up. She doesn't have a chance to do this. She's like, what? All the animals are good. Everything looks in order here to me. So then when the dragon comes to her, she hasn't had the opportunity to distinguish this process. So then... When the dragon says to her, you know, eat of the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She's like, well, the animals God made her good. So she eats it, right? And then we know the process. So what are we getting at here? What we're getting at is that, see, this is how God made us from the beginning. And he has given men the authority, the orders. And then it is up to the man to not just say, okay, these are God or God's orders, but this is why. And so when we get into these, this subject of these two women, Zana is going to want to usurp authority over the man. Wisdom always submits, serves, right? But then it's up to the man to explain why God said what he said. Look, honey, God said, let's not eat from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But this is why. I've been here, I've been naming the animals, I've, and I've determined that there are some good ones and bad ones. So you have to be careful of when you're talking to them that none of them trick you into doing something that God said. Because I had to go through the process to determine that there were good animals and there are bad animals. And we may not know which are which until we learn this process. So honey, you've got to learn the process of determining which are good or bad. And so guys, when we have couples and we all know it, when you have a relationship and we all know it within a short period of time and you say, the woman is wearing the pants, well, guess what? That's out of order. And what's going to happen is the same thing. She's going to be put in places of authority where she's not going to distinguish between the good and the bad animals, the good voices and the bad voices. And so what's good will become bad, evil will become good, and it will be completely out of God's order. Okay? So that's what Zana wants. Zana wants to... Um, doesn't want to submit, wants control, uh, you know, will manipulate to get it. So what I'm trying to do is explain this in a way of God's order from the beginning. And I believe that the relationship with Adam and the animals and not, you know, naming, naming them and forming relationship and de determining and distinguishing this process is something that no one has really explained to us, but it's also very important, okay? So, um, as I thought, this was long. <laughs> Those two things that I wanted to do tonight that are not on the notes, um, I apologize. 
Um, but uh, I also believe it's, it's just vitally important. Because we're going to be able to look at things that are in the Word of God of controversial subjects. And remember, Zana wants confusion. You know, her fruit is confusion. And there's probably no subject more confusing than this. Yet it's so simple. You know that what I just explained to you is so simple. Now, the outworking of it is the same thing. You have to take God's commands and then outwork it. Okay, if we've been out of order, we now have to put things in order. But we have to be honest and say, look, I'm wrong. Swallow our pride. Who cares? We're all wrong. We all have to change. So, um, this is a process of getting, getting things in order, getting things aligned, um, and building God's pattern so His glory can rest on us. And then we can ultimately do the things He's called us to. So, um, so I guess we'll have part three. So guys, I, uh, I thank you for watching up to this point and listening. And um, I will have another uh, part to this, um, hopefully soon. So God bless you, Lord, keep you and prosper you. And oh, that you would know him and his love and that you'd spend time with him in his garden. And just the best. All right, guys. I hope to see you soon.